The moth motif is ever present throughout this game. It's our book and shots on our loading screen and tattooed upon Ellie. The moth is some beautiful representation of Ellie. A moth to a flame, the saying goes, and Ellie is drawn towards Abby, an ex-Firefly with destructive results. That's my favorite extraction from the symbol, but there are so many others that fit so perfectly for Ellie's character, such as the transformation she undergoes, they can see through the darkness, and more often than not, they aren't considered beautiful. They were actually going to make a cure. It would kill her. I saved her. I didn't expect Joel to tell anyone what he did, but if you're going to tell anyone, your brother is a safe bet. What do you do? The seriousness in Joel's eyes here. He understands the full weight of what he's done, but none of the details really matter because saving his daughter, to him, justifies it all. And this look, god damn, the acting here is off the fucking charts. Let me just gush now because throughout this whole game, not one performer misses their mark. They all brought their A game, not just the performers, but also the motion capture team. Say whatever you will about this game, this is a technical marvel. How they made this game look this good on seven-year-old hardware is fucking beyond me. I forget I'm even playing a game sometimes. Jesus Christ, Joel. That's a... That's a lot. This opening is somewhat priming us to believe what Joel did was reprehensible, but I think it's okay because everyone has had seven years to decide where they fall on Joel's choice. Funnily enough, the argument among fans is focused on if Joel should have taken her, not if Joel should have murdered everyone. Everyone kind of forgets about that part. I was supposed to take her to the Fireflies and walk away. You go halfway across the country with someone. She needed her immunity. It means something. Because of her, they were actually going to make a cure. It would kill her. I saved her. And if for some stupid ass reason you missed out on the first game, Joel gives you a quick recap of the major plot points. But go play the first game. It's a whole Abby's physique better than this game. We should head back. Joel's surprised that Tommy so quickly wants to head back. Seems like he was hoping to talk through what he did more, but Tommy doesn't give it to him. Say what you will about this script, but Neil does a bang up job on directing the actors. Jesus fucking Christ! Gustavo Santalaya returns for the score of this sequel and fuck! Does he hit it out of the park again? The man is a genius. The score feeds so beautifully into whatever emotion is being pulled from a scene, and believe it or not, the man doesn't even read or write music. Well, he writes music, but not onto sheets. He gets someone else for that. It's just completely unadulterated artistry coming from the soul with this man. Even beyond the insane mocap work, the whole fucking game is gorgeous. Literally every frame a painting. This is the reason I like to believe this game was delayed and not for other reasons. I don't know much about the technical side of things, but I do know creating sprawling environments like this is not easy. And to think our hardware is just getting better. This might be just what gas stations look like, but it suspiciously looks like the station from The Walking Dead when Carl recreates the gas can walk. About what we were talking about earlier. I'll take it to the grave if I have to. Everyone deserves a brother like Tommy. Come on. Very tastefully done opening credits. Even pausing them so Tommy and Joel can share their dialogue. Blinking and you'll miss it, but Ellie before her falling out with Joel draws and sketches deer in her journal. Deer are often associated with beauty, innocence, and gentleness. All traits younger Ellie possesses. What's up, Joel? Just checking in. Give this scene to lesser actors and it wouldn't come off nearly as perfect as it does here. The chemistry Troy and Ashley share is uncanny. Literally every scene between the two is captivating. Finally, a game that uses the touchpad in a way outside of a giant button. If I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. People rag on the themes of this game for being very elementary. I don't see how that's an intelligent dig at the game as some of the best stories keep their themes simple. And through simplicity, something more powerful can be translated to the audience. The first game was about love at its core, about a man learning to open himself back up after a traumatic event. This game is about a woman losing herself, everyone, and closing herself off after a traumatic event, and that's just one of them. We never get to hear these two ever say the words, I love you. We don't need to. To me, right here is when he says it out loud for the first time. There's an argument to be made for his statement about always finding someone to fight for in the first game, but this one's explicit as hell. No, 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 no. I don't know the first thing I about this. I promise that I teach you how to play. Keeping your promise. Did... Do you remember the joke? If those pun books taught me anything about you, Ellie, you're gonna love it. It's time-consuming. <laughs> That's so dumb. <laughs> 
Also, this is adorable. <laughs> Broken up one week and you make a move on my girl? I don't care. Get dressed. You're the worst. <laughs> it's kind of fucked up you did that. <sighs> you can always count on Jesse to bring some levity. Debs have figured out mirrors for a while now, but they always impress me. So, as I'm sure you all know, Naughty Dog games are notorious for the insane attention to detail, such as this table being scuffed from this being her knife holster. I'll mention some as we go, but this video is already long enough. Let me see if I got this right. You kissed Dina. It was a strange night, man. Sounds exciting. Everything leading up to Joel's death is a big disarm. The dance, the cute high school relationship banter, the snowball fight, everything is so perfect. Most of us know better, so instead of being disarmed, we are filled with dread, just waiting for the hammer to fall. See, Abby isn't the only one that pets dogs to make her likable. I'm kidding, Abby's is so fucking egregious. Last night, I was drinking too much. Nice, Seth, shift blame. That's always a great way to start an apology. What you got there? Bigot sandwiches. Bigot sandwiches. You know what I love about you? How you let me finish my sentences. Every new character introduced besides the one we aren't supposed to like, uh, sorry, ones we're supposed to come to understand are done exceptionally well. I don't hate them, find them annoying, or wish Joel was there instead. I'm kidding, I miss Daddy Joel, but still, the new characters are done well. Not exactly a combat tutorial, but it kind of is, but it doesn't want to commit to it completely. Snowball bites are fun. Ellie's horse is named Shimmer. Kinda like how once Ellie goes to see Atoll, there's only a shimmer of the destructive side till the horse is killed. And once Shimmer is killed is when Ellie starts calling everyone fuckers. Am I reaching? Dina's horse is named Japan. The only analogs I could come up with is Japan is a beautiful country that's peaceful and graceful. Correct me in the comments if I'm completely off with that interpretation. And don't say her ex-boyfriend is Asian and it was a gift from Jesse. All right, you all know the drill. Jesse's only in his early 20s. The hell did he do to be a seeming patrol lead? Whatever it is, good on him. Yeah. Gustavo's It Can't Last coming in for the first time. This patrol is where Ellie and Dina really explore their feelings about each other, but also the introduction of Abby into their lives. We are told from the start that their relationship can't last, further compounded by the cut to introduce Abby. Abby's nightmares are a consistent reminder of where she is emotionally, and sure, dreams as a representation are a little ham-fisted. It comes with a cathartic payoff for her character later, and I do mean her specifically. With arms like these, I'm surprised she didn't accidentally murder Joel and swing one. Owen's trail is visible from him scouting earlier. What is going on with you? Mel's pregnant. Throughout the game, there's parallel after parallel of Abby in relation to Ellie and Joel's respective journeys. Neil pulled out all of his tricks to really try and make us care about Abby. I've grown to like that tattoo of yours. Interesting. Shut up. Okay. The flirting is cute, and those who hate are just sad they ain't got it. Fuck. You can stay at this view as long as you like. This is the last moment as Ellie do you get to just appreciate the world before everything starts going wrong. Flashbacks don't count. Notice Dina always did the sign-ins when out with Eugene. Now that Ellie's coming with her, she's the boss man. There's so much great stuff to unpack inside this journal that we'd be here forever if I went through it. Like living a long life. You? No way. Come on. You're way too reckless. Says the one that stands on glass to start a firefight through it. Please die of old age and not because you get infected. <laughs> deal. Don't think Ellie has ever heard a better deal in her life. <laughs> So glad that our non-player characters are competent. This quick draw, patience, and murder of this clicker is a great moment for Dina. This is why the game truly got delayed. Naughty Dog could have just done what Tilu did and have Ellie's shoulder roll her upgrades, but these animations are so well done, I can't complain. Oh my god, it's weed. This is a huge missed opportunity for Jackson. They could have used weed as a trading commodity. Gotta be a safer trade than bullets, if you know what I mean. And bitches love weed. I watched a compilation of kissing in video games just for you guys, to judge whether or not this is the best kissing animations in a game I've ever seen. And I was right. Again, the mocap work here is absolutely insane. Hey, I'm Tommy. That's Joan. What's your name? Once they're inside and get a second to breathe, Abby is shook as fuck and can't take her eyes off Joel, even after Tommy grabs her attention. Just replaying and rewatching this scene for this video gets my heart rate up every time. This is my brother. Joel. 
Fuck, you can hear a pin drop when Joel says his name. These fuckers just won the lottery. Because they have. Don't know if Owen was scared of Abby or just caught off guard by the shotgun blast. Either way, it lends me to really liking him more. Why don't you say whatever speech you got rehearsed? Get this over with. Facing death like a badass. God damn it! Also, Joel handles this tourniquet like a G. These bitches are some of the worst pain you can feel. Then the pain of the other half of the limb not receiving blood taking over, and then getting the shit beat out of you by She-Hulk? Joel doesn't even pass out from all of that pain compounding upon him. Motherfucker was no one to mess with, and she needed this cheap shot to kill him. Please don't shoot. Joel, please get up. <laughs> Joel's death was something. We all expected him to die in a sequel, but not like this. It's not what we wanted, but that's okay. If developers always catered to what the fans wanted, we wouldn't have great games or risks taken. This was a massive gamble, and whether or not it paid off is up to each player to decide for themselves. Also, the reason Joel allowed himself to be caught in this situation is because of his time in Jackson. He's grown soft and started being too trusting. This is confirmed by Troy Baker in an interview. He said he felt he failed as an actor because he wanted to show at some point during the scene that Joel regretted lowering his guard, but didn't get it into his performance. It makes sense. Stop complaining. Tommy survived! Dude's got a titanium cranium or something. Also, doesn't he look like Rick Grimes a little bit with the fur collar and all? In the four-year jump, we don't get to see how Ellie grew up in Jackson, but I enjoy seeing the love Ellie shares with Tommy and Maria. It's obvious that Joel's family has become hers, and it's nice. This is the first time All Gone is played in Tilu 2. This was the same track used for many important moments in the first game, such as Sarah's death, David's death, and Joel running with Ellie at the end. It's sort of the de facto theme for Loss, and it's perfectly placed here. Having us travel through Joel's house is such a welcome addition. Most players are still reeling from Joel's murder, and it's a beautiful visual eulogy for him in a sense. We get to learn so much about him through his home, and my favorite little detail is seeing the idiot's guide to space on his nightstand. We'll find out later that Ellie loves space, and he's just trying to get a little closer to her. Got it. We thought the world was overgrown in the last game. Now it's been bumped up to 11. It was so cool thinking we were in the middle of a forest then to stumble upon a traffic light and have the realization of where we actually are. I take back what I said in my Fallen Order video. These rope physics are so impressive. The little pseudo open world might have been half-baked, but it was cool nonetheless to ride around here and explore. And also that immersive map was pretty cool as well. I wonder what it was like to serve on a jury, but it was fun. Is anyone going to tell Dina how wrong she is? I've always dreamed of fixing up a farm. That sounds lonely. Only if you're doing it alone. Okay. It's adorable that this little offhand conversation becomes a brief reality for these two. Alright. I got it. I'm glad Naughty Dog made her companions not just watch us run around and do everything. You ask this guy a question, but you don't make him say it. And then you ask this guy, and if the facts match, Telling the truth. Tommy did this. Seems to be a tactic that runs in the family. This is the second time that they use what I like to call Tilu travel, where they show your destination off in a distant wide shot. I always enjoy it as it makes the world feel a lot bigger. <laughs> Through this and Ellie's journal, you can surmise that Dina is pregnant. And it's cool that Naughty Dog gives us all this prelude before telling us. It's all of them. Everyone's gotta have a to-do list, just some people's are more on the Arya Stark side of things. <laughs> Dina saves us, what, three times in this chase scene? Fucking love you, Dina. Maria and Tommy and Joel are the only ones who know. Knew. Oh, that'll get ya. I think I'm pregnant. Now Ellie's got a pregnant companion just like Abby, and it's reasons like this people don't like Abby's side of the story. Dina is a month pregnant and doesn't go out for the rest of the game, whereas Mel does eight month pregnant parkour. Joel, we love watching a movie in this place. We miss you, Joel. Don't forget that Ellie was gonna invite him to watch a movie the day he died. Ellie plays this song for the first time after finding out Dina is pregnant and right before our first Joel flashback. This is a perfect placement to me as Ellie and Dina's relationship is being strained and has Joel stuck in her head. Next door to Sarah Lake, so. Ugh, I suck. Say what you will about flashbacks. Lost built an entire TV show on them. 
But everyone was delighted to find out that we get to have more Joel and Ellie together in the game. Oops. Ah! What is wrong with you? <laughs> you should see your face right now. God, the chemistry between these two is unreal. We got a lot of detention. You know, you really need to stop letting me while you up. Some advice Ellie obviously ignores, but see everyone? The vengeful nature has always been inside her. See, there's a sequel. It wasn't as good. Like this game? Ten, nine, ignition sequence starts. Ellie isn't just listening to some rocket launch. She's listening to the Apollo 11 launch, the one that put men on the moon. I do okay. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Some say that this flashback is cheap and unearned, and maybe. But I'm sure those same people love the shit out of the sequence. With all the heartache these two have shared between each other, it's great to see at least a little bit that they got to have moments like these. And here's a reminder of what these flashbacks are actually going to be about. How'd you fix it? It was a loose connection. For those paying attention, Dina knows how to do this because Eugene taught her. <laughs> <laughs> The animations here in the gameplay are so brutal and satisfying. Chopping people up never felt so good. What the hell are you doing here? I think I'd let you do this on your own. So, this was bad. Naughty Dog blatantly lied to us. Which isn't anything new for studios to do when marketing a game. If you remember leading up to the first game, Naughty Dog was adamant that we wouldn't play as Ellie. It's because they completely swapped the characters that makes it so egregious. But... Before I remove a win, this switcheroo didn't come from a malicious standpoint. Naughty Dog wanted to protect the fact that Joel died early in the game, and for that reason, we have a net win of zero. Uh, and hey, sure, we were expecting Joel from the trailers and Tommy from the dialogue, but surprise, motherfucker, it's Jesse. I didn't see that coming. See that truth? That's your plan. Love that his plan is just to run into like 15 guys and jack their truck. People hate on Jesse, but I love him. And look. We get to see what Naughty Dog does best. You okay? Never better. Keeping things light, Jesse. Do you think before they got to the door, Jesse was like, Hey, I'm gonna stand to the side while you knock so we can surprise her. I just think it's funny given that they almost died like 14 times today. Got stragglers. Some more setup and payoff for later with Tommy being an excellent sniper. Like a migration, when the barometric pressure reaches a certain temperature st Shit, I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that music store down there. I bet they got guitar stuff. I mean, that area's long overdue for a sweep anyway. Tommy, you motherfucker, you know exactly what you're doing. Savage Starlight comic books that you're into? Yeah. Did you like them? Oh, well, you know what? Not really my cup of tea, but... It's so cute that Joel is reading a comic like Savage Starlight just so he can bond with Ellie about it. Yeah. I mean, he definitely deserved it, but... That was a nice twist, I believe, Stacy. Yeah, not all twists are nice, Joel. You impressed? Nope. You're just too skinny. Need to eat more. God, did they hit the nail on the head with the dad dialogue for Joel. So many times from a father figure in my life have I heard that. I mean, every bloater has to go through the clicker stage to get here, so I imagine his ears are just as attuned as the clickers. The acting is too good in this game. Look at Ellie's eyes before she's ripped through the wall. <laughs> Fake out death spree with Daddy Joel going sicko mode in that bloater. Love it. What are you doing? What if there's like two bloaters back there? It'll be fine. Really, Joel? You're just gonna take that on faith? Because just two moments ago, you got sneak attacked by a bloater and almost lost Ellie. Uh, confidence? No, Jesse and I are just friends. I know, I've got a pretty keen eye for these sort of things. Not so keen with this one. Growing up in Texas, Joel, I'm not surprised you're clueless about Ellie in this regard. Only they were immune, right? I know I'm a broken record, but Jesus, there needs to be a category for best actor in a video game, and I'm not only talking the voice acting. This might be a stretch, but hear me out. The shot on these two bodies feels like a microcosm of the themes of these games. The skeletal body being Sarah's death, and the clicker being Joel when we meet him at the start of the first game. Sure, his heart is beating, but he might as well be dead. Until Ellie comes along and cures him, Joel has to come face to face with what his decision has wrought. By curing the world, he'd be doing himself back to who he was, this clicker. Two games worth of storytelling relayed in just one shot. I probably explained poorly what my brain feels when I see this shot, but 
I hope you understand. Or maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I don't fucking know. She might have helped Jesse with his toes, but I bet she didn't kiss them like here, Ellie. Don't be too jealous. What, you're gonna go now? Yeah, we have a lead. Hmm, you have a lead and you have to see it through. Sound like anyone we know? Hey, there's the crane bridge. <laughs> the whistles of the scars are so unnerving, I love it. You still hear his screams? I hear them every night. Wow, Nora, are we getting a sympathetic antagonist? That little bitch got what he deserved. Oh. Oh, fucking shoot her, Ellie. No! Don't pistol whip her! Everything's sparse. Ellie's not just a murder machine. She's smart. Playing to her strengths. Not so subtle red like foreshadowing what Ellie's about to do. Some might disagree, but I like that we are forced to press square to make Ellie torture Nora. It makes us feel the guilt right along with Ellie versus passively watching her doing it. She's hiding out in the... in this aquarium. Okay. Another reason people take to Ellie's side of the story so much more than Abby's. When she tortures someone, it's only for information and she doesn't enjoy it versus someone else we know. Making a vaccine would have killed you, so I stopped them. I'll go back. But we're done. This is what we expected and hoped this entire game would be about. But we get to have it and a whole nother story, so why be upset? Fuck, Ellie, how are you still fighting with all those wounds? I guess Joel raised her and we all know he could take a fucking hit. Damn, they didn't need to go all that out of the way to make this so comprehensive. You can play whole ass songs on this bitch. Does that, does Jesse's hair count as a mullet? I'm going with yes. She had a rough night. Barely could get her to keep water down. You should have woken me up. Fuck, even with all that you've gone through, you want to be there to help? This is why we love Ellie. Is she pregnant? Yeah. But we got to take her back. She needs real care and she's not going to get that. Yeah, I know. Jesse and Owen are wise men. Hi. Oh, that delivery is so sweet. Last time, I promise. This game is drop dead gorgeous to look at. Naughty Dog heard that it's a wet city and they're like, alright, I'm gonna run with that shit for the rest of my life and threw in Raging Rapids. Rogue wave, Ellie! You'd be horrible at life, right? <laughs> oh no, Ellie kills dogs. She's a horrible person. Nah, she was just defending herself. Time does Abby risk her life for you? She chose this. I'm not fucking going there. Then don't! Go back. Damn, if Owen wasn't such a nice guy, he would have survived Ellie's wrath. He was legit about to leave after Abby, but felt the need to explain himself to Mel. <laughs> Ellie didn't know Mel was pregnant, and I doubt she'd murder a pregnant woman just for some petty revenge. Come on, let's go. Let's go. That's gotta be a Miller family trademark, no? But she gets to live. Is that okay? It has to be. Ellie literally gave up on her revenge quest for those she loves, and people are still hating. Tommy's holding his back. Is it because he's old? Actually, no. And it's because he threw down earlier. We let you both live. And you wasted it. Anger, anger, anger. Dad? Dad? This is the most pivotal moment in the whole game. You either Dad! stopped playing here or gave the game a chance. This was a structural choice that sent ripples throughout every other decision Naughty Dog made. This shift to Abby is the reason this YouTube channel exists, so for as much as I hate it, I couldn't be happier for it. Notice Abby enters the maw of a whale, literally entering the belly of the whales. Literally entering the belly of the whale section of her hero's journey. Then to be confronted with the colossal squid. The two creatures regularly do battle with each other. Abby's dad saves zebras, and so does Abby. They're actually great people, don't you know? More interesting is Abby is having her experience with the zebra at the same time that Ellie is having hers with the giraffe. I'm aware of the situation. And you're okay with killing her? No. Are you asking me? Are you telling me this is how it's gonna be? I like getting more insight into Marlene's choice to buy into the surgery, and the cameo doesn't hurt. I'm gonna go tell Joel. Why? He traveled across the country with her. He has a right to know. Damn, does this make Joel's action feel even more reprehensible? I know that was the point, but fuck, they are laying it on thick. If it was me... I'd want you to do the surgery. Both Ellie and Abby wanted the surgery to commence. I feel like in a different world, these two would have been friends. We're here for him. That's it. It's too risky to leave them alive. Too fucking bad. I'm sure you noticed it by now, but I freaking love Owen. A really, really good location to establish a settlement. <laughs> hey, the dude literally caught a bullet. <laughs> that was a lot of blood, right? She shouldn't be out. That's the smartest thing you've said since day one started. 
Group 7, sit tight. Be right back. Too much to do to wait around like this. <laughs> Must really be cutting into your jerking off time. Didn't know the critical role cast was in with the wolves. Speak of the devil. Yeah, sounds about right. Are these all ours? And more are coming in by the hour. I really wish we opened some of these body bags and were greeted with models we've seen wasting as Ellie. Which we know they aren't because of the timelines, but in my head canon they are, so... Fuck you. Don't fuck with Isaac. Isaac will fuck you. I mean, fuck you up. These are fucking horrifying. If you really kill Danny... Fuck Danny. Yeah, fuck Danny. Some random ass character that we don't give two shits about that is meant to propel Abby's plot? Think about it. If Danny didn't fight Owen, Abby doesn't go after Owen and doesn't meet the cult people, which means Owen probably stays alive and Dina and Ellie go live on the farm peacefully and we have a happily ever after. Fuck Danny. Aquarium's due west of here. Keep following the sun, right? Using the environment in this way to guide the player is such a novel idea. All this work Owen puts into the aquarium speaks so much of his character. I love it. Just, just through this, I feel like I know Owen more than Abby. Owen adds to Max's drawings with this mural of Salt Lake City, bringing in the ideas of unification of the younger and the older, but also with the peaceful, beautiful landscape of most likely the last time he held on to so much hope. But it's incomplete. Somewhat indicative of Owen's worldview. He's got hope for this peaceful world, with prey living together in unity, but there are predators out there looking to ruin it all. Hence the line in the uncompleted portion of the mural. She's into this Christmas thing, and uh, it's our one year. So, everyone deserves a man like Owen. <laughs> Jesus Christ can Lev work that bow. What is all this? Gotta take her apart. I'm gonna fix her back up. You gotta see down to the roots of the problem to truly face it and overcome it. Just like our two leads. It's a lead. I gotta see it through. Snatch that fucking wig, Owen! These scars tell us so much history of what Owen's been through. Did they sample my apartment for this? Did you hear what they called me? Yeah. Do you want to ask me about it? Do you want me to ask you about it? No. Okay. Showing an ounce of respect. For once. I thought you were anti-electricity and all that sinful old stuff. There are exceptions. Demonizing something while still reaping the benefits from it? What does that remind you of? What's going on between you and your friend Owen? Oh my god, Lev, now? <laughs> We finally get to walk across what we thought was just an awesome backdrop. This is as vertical as we've ever had in a Last of Us encounter, and it's a lot of fun. This area of the game is a great nugget of world building. All over you can find notes discussing what life was like in the opening days of the outbreak. It's harrowing stuff, and would be an awesome setting to tackle in a game such as this. <laughs> this dude is disgustingly terrifying. This is something you'd expect to find after 25 years of growth. This gives me flashbacks to when Joel went sicko on that bloater. Maybe we stopped looking for the light. Maybe. Abby admits that she wasn't interested in being a good person. All she wanted was vengeance, and this is one of the moments that actually made Abby genuinely feel human. Not that I'm scared of heights and dog petting bullshit we've been fed. Here's the payoff I mentioned earlier. Actually, I'm going with them. But not if you come. I haven't always done the right thing. You're a piece of shit, Abby. Right on, Mel. Bring that high school shit back from the start of the game. And also, is that Mel speaking or the fan base speaking? What trespassers? I'm moving up! Finally, a shakeup of the gameplay loop in a refreshing, fun way. Fuck, he's good. Damn right he's good. Let's just... Look out, Jesse! I mean, Danny. I guess you can't. Sorry. I can't shut up about it. The wet brown wood contrasting the shiny green forest is gorgeous. Shouldn't we head back for our boat? No. I hear fighting back there. I hear fighting everywhere. It's such a shitty reason why they can't go back, but it's a reason, I guess. Isaac. I want to know more about Isaac. The fact that his presence alone makes Abby shit her pants lends to something about him that's awesome. <laughs> God damn, Abby fucks this guy up, maiming the location where they scar themselves. In a way, it's kind of making a mockery of their tradition. Abby and Lev getting metaphorical payback from all the scars have done to them. Composition is everything. Lev was there the whole time. Stop! Stop! I like how the scene is shot differently as Abby is framed as our protagonist here. It'd be cool if Ellie could still infect people with her bites. 
I'm sure they played around with that idea, and it's probably for the best that they didn't go for it, but it's still cool. Don't ever let me see you again. Turning a new leaf, I guess? Just like Joel's house, Ellie's house is given the same attention to detail. Like Ellie taking some of Joel's wood carvings and paintings. JJ definitely stands for Jesse and Joel. Hey, you know what? I'm gonna teach you how to play guitar. When your hands are bigger. Like father, like daughter. If RDR2 is gonna have horse nuts, we're gonna have sheep nuts. God, her PTSD has Joel screaming for her to help him. I couldn't even come close to imagining what it's like to deal with that amount of guilt. Oh, that's quite a Tommy's alive too, Electric Boogaloo! She made me a promise. I don't fucking care. That's your gut. It's not that she doesn't care, Tommy. It's that she cares so much. This has got to be what Ellie and Dina name as their song. He had no right. And you do? I don't need your fucking help, Joel. Right. My heart hurts. Oh, Ellie wearing Joel's coat from their last conversation. I have to finish it. Hey, stop. Hey, hey. She doesn't get to be more important than that. This whole scene breaks my heart. Then to cap it off with their theme coming in, coming true. Doves wearing Converse, just like Ellie, I get it. <laughs> I love that this man's first reaction to a child is to put his entire being into a right hook to his temple. Uh, that's what sports equipment feels like! What the fuck you say? Oh, bitch. <laughs> Get to her before that infection takes over. <sighs> Love this reaction. I like that Ellie willingly enters the slaver camp, going all the way to the cells and then the pillars. Ellie is still a slave to her vengeance, whereas Abby started looking for the light again in pursuit of the fireflies. Fun little fake out Abby. Ellie decides not to just attack Abby right away, probably due to Abby not attacking her and just going straight for Lev. Abby carrying Lev at the end of the game, just like Joel with Ellie. It's not until Ellie has a flash of not seeing Joel's face again that she is fueled with hatred again. And as she's choking on Abby, she sees him for the first time again. Ugh, Dina, why you gotta put y'all's album on the top of the guitar from Joel? That's just a one-two punch of emotion to throw at Ellie as a reminder of what she lost through this. The song Joel's playing is called Helplessly Hoping. Fitting. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. God, is the final scene so great. My favorite moment is when Joel tells her he wouldn't change a thing about his choice. And to me, Ellie's reaction is her realization of how much her life does matter. To Joel. Bookends. What can I say that hasn't already been said about The Last of Us Part 2? This game was a divisive monster to say the least, plagued with review embargoes that didn't help its case and leaks that ruined many people's experience with it. I was fortunate enough to avoid all the leaks and got to experience the game blind, but even with experiencing the events of the story in the way intended, it absolutely did not resonate with me when I finished it my first time. I was angry, upset, confused, and disappointed. So much so that I wanted to create a video talking about my experience with the game. I had never had any intention of doing YouTube at all until I played this game. Back then, I wanted to rip into this game about how Joel's character was assassinated, and how horrible the pacing is, and everything you've heard a thousand times by other reviewers. After some time of letting the game sit with me and watching it get ripped to shreds online, I decided to create this channel. Like CinemaWin's slogan, because liking things is more fun, and it is. Being negative is easy. Nothing sells better than bad news. Hating on things seems to be everyone's default nowadays, and I decided not to be a part of that and try to look deeper and have a more understanding perspective on video game narratives and not to get rinky-dinky on you, life. 
I'll start talking about the game here in a second, but for all the game's faults, there are things to be enjoyed here and it holds a special place to me as I wouldn't be reading the script right now if not for it. Hopefully some of you are still with me after that. The Last of Us Part 2 is not the game we wanted, and it's not the game we expected either. This was the game Naughty Dog wanted to make. The people there aren't idiots. They could have focused the whole story on what we experienced in the flashbacks, with the revenge being tied to Abby killing Dino like we thought we were going to have. But honestly, I'm glad they didn't. They took a huge risk to tell a story nobody saw coming, and an even bigger risk by creating Abby. So let's talk about her. I've rewritten this section of the video over and over again, trying to talk about the positive of Abby's half of the storyline, and it's been… rough. Here I'm just going to talk about my feelings about her, because as much as I want this channel to be about positivity, I think being constructive can fall along that line without becoming hateful. Abby was a risk that Naughty Dog wanted to try out. They wanted to see if they could make us empathize with her and forgive her after seeing her side of the story. The issue with the way they approached it is they tried to fast track that progress with things like Abby playing fetch, her being afraid of heights, saving a zebra. Compound this with a very weird structural decision to split the game into two halves, there was no way it was going to work out. First, the problem with those cheap tactics is because that's all they are. Cheap. Too surface level and not deep enough within the character to really make us care. I feel like replacing those things with actions she does with other characters would have been a much stronger option. Like I mentioned earlier, the moment with Owen where he is talking about not looking for the light, I love that shit and her response made me actually feel something and ponder her character a thousand times more than her being scared of heights. Give me more moments like that. But the main issue with trying to have us empathize with Abby is how Naughty Dog structured the story. If you reorganize the events of the story to have the park section open the game, run the Jackson segment, then bounce back and forth between Ellie and Abby for the Seattle sections, it would have been a much better experience for the player. This way, our introduction to Abby isn't just her murdering our Joel. I don't know. There has been so much already said about the Abby stuff, I don't really feel that I'm adding much to the conversation. I want to talk about Ellie. We love Ellie. We're biased to her? Of course we are. Nothing she could do could stop us from that. Even when she is making the wrong decisions at the end of the game, we still love her. And that's another thing holding Abby's story back. That's not even her fault. It's that we've had a whole game with Ellie and Joel. Our personal biases could not be overcome in just half of a game. And no matter how many dogs Ellie kills or how many times Abby plays fetch. Just no way. Back to those wrong choices Ellie made throughout, we have to look at those from her point of view as much as we can. The reason her hard-on for revenge is so strong isn't just because of Joel's death, but what it's done to her. She's a wreck. She can't even live a happy life anymore because of the guilt that is plaguing her. She's trying her best, but there's a huge wall between her and Dina. And that's not fair to Dina. I'll say it up and down for the rest of my life. We can't live our lives for other people. We've got to live for ourselves first. That might sound selfish, but it's in the same vein as you can't love others until you love yourself. So I don't blame Ellie for her choices throughout the game. This conclusion has kind of been all over the place and not narrowing down specific ideas I know. I hit the main two things about Abby and Ellie that seem to be the most divisive in my book. There is so much to discuss about this game that I'm planning on making a second video with a different format to continue my thoughts on the game, so make sure you subscribe to catch it when it releases. I've said a lot about the characters and themes of the game in the main portion of the video, and I think I want to talk more broadly now. The Last of Us Part 2 wasn't a game made to be a cash cow people pleaser. It was a game made by a team that had a vision, and the fact that they didn't back down from that is commendable. After watching interviews with the Naughty Dog team, it wasn't easy for them to make some of the choices they did, chief among them killing Joel. Neil said it himself, and I agree with him. Nobody loves these characters more than me. Joel and Ellie are his babies. This game was not easy to create for the entire Naughty Dog crew. I think my main takeaway from this game is being negative is easy. Hate is our default, and judgment is all we ever see anymore. But instead of that, we need to look beyond what we see. Dig deeper for understanding, and hopefully through those pursuits, we become greater people. Life is complicated and people are messy. We are all going to make mistakes and no one is perfect. Ellie and Abby let each other live. It made a lot of us angry when Ellie didn't kill Abby in the end. And I think the fact that we got so upset about this was the reason Naughty Dog made this game. Art is supposed to make you feel something and challenge us. And through these feelings, I believe we can learn something about ourselves and each other.